Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Rico. Good morning. Oh, my goodness. Hey, Claudio. Good evening. Ah, good morning. Uh, good evening. Hey, guys, you know, uh, just let you know real quick, I haven't forgotten. I actually, we will discuss today the 80 shooting drills, the 40 center drills. And I do have all that stuff. If for some reason I couldn't send it today, uh, we had a problem yesterday on our internet and we actually had to call. I think partially is because we're using so much internet and I think his internet's getting kind of slow because we were sending so much stuff out. So I couldn't do it. So actually right now I have Tony and Sarah actually looking into it. And when it's finished, I will send it to you. Okay. So I will share with you here, but we do have it. Um, by the end of the week, my, uh, my goal is to send a PowerPoint on the counterattack that is basically ready. Um, the passing drills, I already sent it to you, but I'm sending the 80 shooting drills, uh, the 40 center drills, 40 defender drills, 40 driver drills. And then what we like by May 1st, we are talking with some people about uh, we're going to do a video on all of them. Because, again, it's not just about having the drill, it's how to use the drill. You know, so um, one of the things that I've learned, and like I said, I've been very lucky to have had, to have had work with some amazing people. And uh, one of the things that we have learned is that, you know, you can have a drill and if it's not used correctly or in the right order, you know, then the drill is not, you know, very, you know, very, uh, let's say, active, you know. So uh, we will do it with the videos. These videos are all like about 30 seconds long. Uh, they all be put on the apps of course you know you all be you. all be and then all of you guys that are part of, of this when we start our um everybody that's been on my uh talks just so you know uh when we do our whole uh six eight academy metric and evaluation and everything else you will receive everything for free so all your coaching tips all your coaching videos or everything is going to be free Okay, so, um, so everything is going to be given to you. You can look at it. And then if you do need to get something a little more in depth, uh, where it's going to take a, a more time to explain or something like this, I mean, you, I'll be sending you guys some, some kind of testing with the key answers, of course. It's not mm -hmm. about eliminating anybody. It's about us becoming better coaches. I mean, that's one thing I never really understood is why is somebody not out there helping us? You know, I, I really feel that. I feel that um, as a teacher, when I was teaching, I felt that I could always go to university and talk to professors about helping me become a better teacher. Well, I don't see that in the coaching world. And in the coaching world, that's what we are. We are teachers. You know, most of us are teachers. So I, I just don't feel that the organizations out there are doing a good enough job to help us out and I'm talking about all of them. I'm not picking on anybody in particular, but I'm taking a USA Water Polo, a WANA, a Consanat, Sisekan, FINA. I mean, they have all the resources, and yet I don't see them putting out there stuff that's going to help us out. I mean, the way I look at it, you know, they always want stuff from us. But, you know, if we go out there and have, uh, you know, can they give us some technology or can they give us something like that? And, you know, they don't do that. So, I think definitely uh, we're going to be able to do that. We're going to get it to you guys. And hopefully what we do is that it would be great for me in about a year from now, just create a Zoom chat where we just sit over here and chat about water polo in a fun way, you know, like I said, with everybody discussing. And we'll, we'll do like a tit for tat like I used to do when I was uh, in Italy where we would meet on Wednesday nights and we'd get like five or six coaches and we, each one of us would come up with a situation. You know, I would say, okay, I put a left-hander on the two post. How would you defend that? You know, and then we had like four or five different answers and it was fun, you know, and that to me is what the coaching community should be all about. You know, coaching community should not be about secrets, about uh, it's mine, I'm not going to share. No, no. It's really, I mean, you're telling me that the NFL, the NBA, or the Major League Baseball, or soccer, that there's any secrets. There's no secrets. I mean, everybody has video. Everybody's everything. So, I mean, everybody knows. So, if we can learn how to share and apply, um, you know, 
So, oh my God, I can't believe that stuff. Really? Oh my God. No. Okay. The coaching course that 6H Sports is going to put out, it's free. <laughs> okay. You'll be given everything for free. There is no cost. Okay. Um, and, and, and the reason for Sorry to interrupt. Did you think about to make it for Android as well? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. It, it's already all the way to Android. Actually, yeah, because the they... computer is already an Android. And actually, the one for the phone Android is actually coming up really quick. But it's already an iPad Android and also on computer Android. And the good thing about the course is going to be that I, I really excited about it in the, this coaching course. You know, it, it's it, again, it's not to eliminate anybody. But the idea of the coaching course is that we want to have an area where we will discuss the beginners, the intermediate, the advanced. We'll talk about tactics. We'll talk about technique. We'll talk about... We'll talk basically about everything that a coach should have. And then by creating not only a channel of communication, but we're creating a, a testing system to give it to the players and to give it like, so we can all have knowledge in our hands. Because to me, I think that's the biggest thing I see is that we are not given enough knowledge. And so what happens that most of us, and I'll be honest, I, I'll throw myself right in there. Most of us learn because we go watch somebody do it. Or, you know, most of us learn from experience. Or maybe we screw up for two years before we do it right. I mean, I wasn't just like everybody here when I started coaching. I was a 23-year-old kid, you know, and I want to coach, and I'm given the head coaching job, and I'm sitting over there, and somebody said, Coach, what? Coach what? I mean, there are no books. There's no talking to somebody. I mean, you've got to go out there. And I, like I said, I was lucky that I had played for some of the greatest coaches out there. You know, I had had experience with Markovitz. I had experience with Kemeny. I had experience with Niskowski. I had experience with Horn. So, I mean, I was able to take a lot of that experience, but still there was a lot of failure. I mean, there was a lot of failure. There was a lot of things that I still failed in the beginning because I didn't have a place to go. So to me, what we're trying to do is create that for all the coaches out there. So it doesn't matter where you are, guys. It doesn't matter. It's a coaching community. It doesn't matter where you are. We should be able to help everybody out there. So continue with the training part of thing. One of the things that I wanted to do today is to talk about, you know, the programming and, and really how we're going to use this training. Um, and then I will show you some of the other things that we have done. Um, you know, one thing that they have always bothered me and – and I did a lot of research, and you guys can do your own research, and you're going to find out maybe even more than I did, that the programs with the coaches, and I'm talking, I'm not talking water polo. I was talking, and I, I, I did some research with like football, NFL, soccer, hockey, you know. And what I found is that the programs where the coach was really more of a teacher, kind of like uh, Dean Smith, uh, Shashevsky, Bill Walsh, when the, when the guy was more of a teacher doing practice instead of a coach doing practice, that team was more successful. I thought, well, that's interesting because I consider myself a coach, but am I a coach doing training and game or am I a teacher doing training and coach doing game? And I know that's something kind of out there because you have to kind of think about it. But if you actually look at the American Language Dictionary, <laughs> you will find out that coach is defined as an experienced person guiding someone to achieve his or her goal. That's what a coach is decided as. I mean, if you think about it, that's what a coach is. A coach basically takes a group of people and he's going to try to get that people to achieve a goal. That's a coach. So to me, that's what we do in a game. To me, that's definitely what we do in a game. Come into the game. We're going to take this team, and we're going to have – we're going to try to achieve a win. That's coaching. What about teaching? Teaching is described – teaching is described as a person that brings knowledge and competence to the individual. So it's different. So coaching and teaching are two different things. So I learned that about after about five or six years of coaching. I was like, God, why am I coaching doing practice? Because all you're doing when you're coaching is guiding. You just like basically say, okay, go to the counterattack. 
you know, we always say about that coach that calls every play from the deck, you know, do this, go drive, you drive. Hey, press him, press him. Okay, that's coaching. That's coaching. Okay, that's fine. I mean, each, each person is own. I'm not a big talker in, in games. I like to watch a little bit more. But there's a coach out there that will basically call every play. Drive, you know, run a 21, come back on defense, you know, press, go on the counter, look, 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 look down there, shoot, shoot, shoot. That is all coaching. Uh, come on, guys, we're going to be able to do this. Now, come on, come on, everybody come here together. Okay, we're going to run a 2-3-4, we're going to run an M, we're going to split, we're going to gap high. That's coaching. That's what you do in the game. And some of them are very, very good at it. Some of them are getting good at it. But let's think about the practice. Why would I coach a practice? I would teach a practice. I would take a specific skill and bring knowledge to that skill. So I'm going to take a player. This is why I'm so picky when it comes to technique. And, and that's why any team that I've ever coached did not win always, often, but did not win always. But at least my team knew what was going on. You know, people joke. Anybody that's coached by Rico, they know how to shoot. Because I spend a lot of time on shooting. Or I teach passing. If I'm going to teach shooting, I'm going to teach what legs to use, what core movement, how we're going to proceed the shooting, how to read the goalie, how to read the situation, how to understand the clock, how to understand which leg we're going to use. Are we donkey kicking? Are we spider legging? Are we vertical breast? Are we going to, what release point am I going to use? Am I going to use one, two, three, four? If I am teaching that knowledge and I'm getting my athlete to be competent at that knowledge, wouldn't it, wouldn't you agree that in the game it would be a lot easier to coach? But unfortunately, what I see a lot of times, particularly when I do a lot of visitations in watching practices, and I see a lot of coaching. I see a lot of telling the athlete what to do, but I don't see you really watching the athlete know if he knows what to do. And that's the difference between teaching and coaching, you know? So it, it, I know it's, it's basic, and I, I hope you understand. And if you don't, please, you can ask the question. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we keep the numbers down so we can have questions. But I see the biggest problem that I see, you know, when I was in Italy, um, and I was there for five years, we won every single 15 and under, 17 and under, 19. We won all that. And then we won to the first uh, division. We won second division. Uh, you know, beating some pretty good teams. And then we went to the first division with a team that nobody was over 21 years of age, and we finished in the final four. And what I felt was the reason we did so well, the reason we, we were very, you know, successful is I had two great assistants. One was the president of the club that would volunteer with the 10 and unders and 11 and unders because they were teachers, not once. Did they discuss tactics? I discussed tactics. But all they did is that they taught the kid body position, what legs to use, where to go, what to do. So I, I started looking at it, and let's all look together here. I mean, you look at the programs that have had a lot of success over the years. I look at, for example, like Hungary for years. All those players that came out of those three gold medals in the row, you know, I was the junior coach during many of those years or before that. And they were all taught by Fetcho Kemeny, Feren Kemeny, the father of Dennis Kemeny, the coach that won the three medals. His father was a junior coach of Hungary for over 25 years. And you know, all he did, and I remember talking to him, he's a dear, dear friend. I learned so much from him. And I remember him saying, he says, my job is to make sure that there's a left-hander 18 years old, at 20 years old, at 22 years old. And if there's not one, my job is to go find it, teach it, and put it available. It, and what happened with us, and again, part of us in America, our system doesn't work that way because as a coach, a lot of times you're taking care of the frost soft, the virus, the age group, and everything else. So you're by yourself. But I think if we can break it down into our training programming to more of a teaching mode, okay? And I use a very basic, simple idea. In all, of, Most of us are teachers or we have taught at one time or another in our lives. Um, you basically 
cover a chapter. At the end of a chapter, you give a test and you find out if the students got it or they didn't get it. If they got it, you move on to the next chapter. If 90% of the class got it and 10% didn't, you give the extra work for the 10%. If 90% of the class did not get it and only 10% got it, then you might want to evaluate yourself because obviously the message is not coming out there. It's not getting out there. You know, um, I find that I'm a player's coach, so I, I, I have a tendency to listen to the players more um, and I don't want them to ever fear me. I want them to respect me. So I want to hear what they have to say, and then I'll make the decision. And that seemed, I've never had a problem. I think when you try to intimidate the players too much and try to make them fear you and like, oh my God, coaches, you know, oh, shh. I think what you're going to find out is that a lot of stuff will be happening behind your back. Okay. So if we're using the same system as we do in education, it's been around for thousands of years, why don't we do the same thing in water polo? So you create the system. And then by creating the system, you're going to look at it and you say, okay, we, this week we're going to work on this skill or these three days we're going to work on this skill. At the end of it, have a test. What is a test? That's what 6-8 is all about. 6-8 is a metric. That's all 6-8 is. And right now we're in a process of negotiating U.S. water polos already. Uh, by next year, if this had happened, it would have been this year, JOs, where every single game is going to be metric. That means at the end of the JOs, you're going to know every single player, how many minutes they play, what was the leg, what their weakness, what their strength. And people think that's difficult, but it is not. Because being an unverified uh, system, Basically, parents can help and coaches can help. Anybody can help. Any video can be taken. And then even though, of course, there is a, it's not exactly perfect, you're always going to have that real high percentage that you're going to be able to tell. So that's what 6-8 does. It's a metric. We need to check ourselves. The athletes need to check. I remember when Tony was little, at 11, 12, I figured out that he had a, you know, was pretty, was going to be a pretty good little athlete. So I started using metric on him. You know, I came up with a little ball. I came up with an impact ball where they would sit there and throw it against the wall. I wanted to check his arm speed. I wanted to check his strength, quick lightning, all these things. And I put in a metric. And then what I would do is I'll say, I go, okay, now let's go watch Estiardi. Let's go watch Odin. Tony loved Odin, learned so much from him. Why go? They're all like 10 years old on Antoni. So we watch, and then it's not a question of comparing. You see where you are. So like say, if I am a four driver, okay, and I'm a four driver, and I basically got to compare myself with, you know, a Yeda shot or something like that, I'm going to look at myself, and I'm going to say, okay, he has six shots from this position, and I only have two. That means I have to develop four more if I want to be like him, okay? But if I don't, have a metric i don't know where i am how do i know where you are it's kind of like the parents says well my kid is great compared to what right oh he's really fast compared to what so if a 14 year old you know united states water polo has fifty thousand athletes according to a letter i just got today all right so if a 14 year old goes a 52 5 okay and I have a metric across the whole country that 14-year-olds are going 51A. If I'm that kid that goes 52.5, I'm going to go, whoa, I have to work. I got to get to at least the average. But let's see, what is it, the top percent, the top 10% of the athletes are doing? Oh, they're doing 49.7. Whoa, I got to work. And the same can be done with leg strength, velocity, quickness, and even knowledge. Because you have to create some testing. You have to create some good testing out there. Okay? So let's take a look in here. All right. Let's see if I get it right this time. Whew. All right. Let's see. I'm going to do what that one. All right. So if I am shooting, for example, Right, so I I am looking. This is what you guys are gonna receive it, so you don't need to copy it. But you're gonna get all this stuff, you know. And of course, right now we're up to about 27, I think, on videos. 
So when you are designing your shooting drills, I mean, it's a program. It's a, something that comes over a long period of time. It's not like you're just doing this, just like, you know, ah, today we're going to do this shooting. No. So if you look in here, you start. You have perimeter with no defense. You have the defense still perimeter. That's 50% of the game. It is in the perimeter. You're going to position and special situation. And then you got the game like set up. So let's just take in the middle here. Let's just go. If you look at them, they all have series. There's perimeter series. There's passing from the center, passing for four, two drives, and then shots. And then you go to the perimeter with the defense. This is my favorite part. This is what I spend the majority of my time is in this area right here. Okay. But, and when I say soft, and these are things, of course, you guys can ask. And when I'm finished here, you guys can ask anything you want. Um, if you look in here, you know, when I say soft means the drill is for the offense. If I say the offense is soft, the, diff, the, the drill is for the defense. So develop your own terminology with your athletes to make sure that your athletes understand what is expected of them. Okay. We're going to position special situations. We have animals. We have centers, you know, insides. And then let's go back in here for a second and talk about this. So when you look at your planning, when you're programming your planning, I mean, first of all, what, what are we looking at? I mean, are we looking, we talked briefly about that, but let's go more into details here. Um, and so if, if you are looking at a training, okay, you have the year. Okay. You can't think of it as 12 months. Nobody can. You can't say, what well, are we going to train all year? No, that's not true. Nobody trains all year. Nobody trains all year. Nobody can train 12 months out of the year. You have rest. You have the weekends. You know, you have Sundays. I mean, you think about it right off the bat. Right off the bat, you got four Sundays in every month. So right off the bat, you got 50 days that you don't work out because there are Sundays. That's 50 days of Sundays. So don't, right off the bat, you, if your year is 360 days around there, if you take 50 out of them, that means, all right, 13% of the time you're already resting. That's why sometimes resting is overrated. Okay, I prefer recovery than rest, personally. Okay, because sport, in a sense, is supposed to be a fun thing. So you can actually recover. You don't have necessarily just to have to go home and sleep. Because that's not resting either, by the way. <laughs> you know, so let, let's, let's talk about the program. So what is your program? You want to go three, four-month basis, or you want to go four, three-month basis? You want to go two, six-month basis? That, that doesn't matter. This is what's called a cycle. What is a cycle? A cycle is you determine whatever your cycle is. And this is what I'm saying. I like to empower our coaches. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't, I hate dictatorship. I think we all, more we talk together, better we all going to become. So let's just say if I have three, four month cycles, that just means what? I got four months of fall season, four months of spring season, four months of summer. Okay. Does that work for high schools? Sure. Because you have the four months of high school season, right? And then you got another four months of usually swim season, and then you got the four months of the summer. Of course, it can be three and a half, you know. I mean, come on, let's not get into <laughs> let's not get into the real, you know, that's that's stupid. All right. Or you have a four, three-month season. Four, three-month season will be maybe uh, a summer is a little smaller. And you have the preseason, season, postseason, summer. There are some programs that will do that. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, so you can basically use, let's say, May, June, July. Okay, as an example. May, June, July as a preseason kind of workout. You don't really call it, you know, um, summer, right? Uh, and then you have like the end of July, August and September, it's kind of like your summer. And then you got a season and then you got your postseason. So there are some people that do that, particularly in other states. It's not all of us have the same season, right? I mean, there are some the season on the fall, but there's places in the United States that the season is on the spring. Okay. If you look at it, for example, Australia, staff is on the call. I mean, their summer is different than our summer. So obviously their seasons are the opposite of our seasons, and they have to go ahead and, 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 and change and have championships in a different way. I know when I, one of the, the things that I don't know if you guys have been following up, but one of the big discussions going in a moment, big, big discussions going in a moment, is are we going to maintain the international season as it is? 
I mean, I have a call tomorrow, you know, to discuss some of those things with, actually there was an email this morning that I, whew, I don't think I want to answer that yet, but there's a lot of talk about moving the international season to the winter and allowing the summer season to be more for competition because it was that way in the 60s. In the 60s and the 70s, most of the championships were in the summer. So if you went to Europe in the 60s, for example, or in Brazil or whatever, it doesn't matter, you played a lot of summer ball, right? So, you know, the weather was hot, the outdoor pools, so everybody played in the summer. It was a great sport. I mean, come on, water polo is a no matter, no matter how you look at it, it's a great sport to be outside, you know? Um, so, but then with, you know, before there was only Olympic game, guys, remember the first world championship was not until 1973. <laughs> people forget that, you know, particularly people that a lot of you guys are young, but you got to understand before 1973, there were no world championships. The first one was in Belgrade, 1973. That's the first one. There weren't even Pan American games before 1950. So, it, it, you know, it might seem like a, lo a long time ago, but it isn't. It's actually fairly new. So there's a lot of these things that have been happening. So what happened is when a lot of these championships, you know, it, when a lot of these championships are starting to come in, I mean, let, let's look together here, guys, and let's look together just in the last 20 years because we're thinking about 2000 now. If I go back to the 80s and 90s, when I first started coaching internationally, you had an Olympic Games every four years. You had a World Championships every four years. Okay, Those are the only ones. You had a FINA Cup that was right before the Olympics. There was always in a place where the Olympics going to be basically to check to see if everything was okay. That's what it was. That's all you had. And then they introduced the junior, World Juniors. Okay, That's it. One. One. There were no women in the Olympics. And until the 90s, or late 70s, when the women got in, they played the world championship, but there was no women in the world championships. In the, I'm sorry, in the Olympic Games. So you had, what, four or five championships? And then let's go to the continent, right? So if you're in the Americas, you had a South America championship, a Sisikon championship, and you had a, a, a Pan Am. If you're in Europe, you had an European championship. If you're in Oceania, you had basically the old famous, you know, New Zealand-Australia game, you know, the best out of three. I mean, no, th th this is the things you got to start thinking about. That's the way it was. Now, let's talk about in the last few years. We went to two world championships in four years. We still have the Olympics. We added the World League that is every year. Okay, so four plus two world championships, right? Plus the Olympics. We already had seven. And then you have world juniors, youth World Youth Championships, and now we have 60 and under World Championship. So we have four, that's 10. Now all of it is men and women, that's 20. Then you have FINA Cup, that's 21. And now, because it's the whole world, you have all the qualifications that we got to put in there. So now you got to put in the Intercontinental qualify for the World League, the World League Finals, and then you got to qualify for the Pan Am, so you have to have the South American, then you got to have, you know, the qualifications for the Youth Championship. The last time I counted, honestly, is over 40. Over 40 championships. Where do we put it? Where do we put it? So they're trying to put all these things during the summer because the kids are out of school. Makes it very hard to program, doesn't it? makes it very hard for you to program your year. So I personally like the three, four month season, you know, coming back to where we were, just I get fired up about this stuff sometimes and I'm sorry about that. But you know, I, I, let's go back to a three, four month season. So I got the cycle of four month season. So four month season gives me 12 weeks, 122 days. And it's gonna break it down to, if I took the Sundays away, I got 18 days in all of them, you know, and every, every three weeks I got 18 days of work, you know, six days a week. Uh, it doesn't mean that 30 minutes a day is considered a work day. So even if I don't want to train on Saturday, but if I put something, the guys have to watch a video on Saturday. You know, high school guys, you know, we, for many years, you know, John, I mean, we've got a lot of coaches over here that I've coached against, you know, great, you know, uh, uh, colleagues of mine. We couldn't train on the weekends. The high school did not permit. 
But what I used to do at Wilson, I knew that we couldn't train over the weekends and stuff. I would say, okay, go watch video. They can do that. They can watch video on the weekend. They're, they're not having to come to school. They can watch video. I can send them home a little research paper on explaining the counterattack, explain what defense we're going to run against Foothill or the defense we're going to run against El Toro, whatever. It doesn't matter. I mean, that's to me, that's a great workout. So my players, they were pretty knowledgeable. I mean, one of the things about the guys coming out of there that we're pretty knowledgeable. So maybe we weren't even as good as far as the biggest guys that we had, those Orange County giant guys. And we go in there with a smaller guy, but our guys were smart. You know, so you can use the training that way. So I break it down. There's 122 days. I break it down into six 18-day cycles, little cycles. So there's the macro cycle and the micro cycle, right? So if I do it every third every 18 days that gives me a great planning technique now those 18 days you got to also see what is your hour rate i mean so you got 18 days are we working out twice are you working out two hours you got 36 hours right? 18 36 you got three hours you got four hours you got two a day you got one hour you can break that down and once you do that and you put it on a spreadsheet you plan your whole workout, and it's not as hard as you think. You're not as hard as you think. Because, again, let's go back to that share screen again. And if I go in here, and I look in here like this on the screen, I can go ahead. Somebody's microphone is on. Uh, I can go ahead in here, and basically, I have 80 to choose from. Look, I got 80, 80, 80 shooting drills. And that's not all of them, by the way, guys. You know, that's – the first one I'm sending out there, you know, you're going to get quite a few of these sheets. Uh, so I can go to here says, okay, I'm going to take uh, four from here, three from here, two from here, one from here. These 10 drills, we're going to work during our 18 day series. And at the end of that 18 day series, I'm going to put them to a metric system, just like six, eight does. That's going to tell me how is he doing when the guy passes from four driving from two in a drive pass, if I throw 20 passes to that guy, right here, number 26. So he drives, the pass is coming from four, right? And the guy's driving from two and he's going to get a drive pass. He's going to do this for three weeks. I want to see how he's doing. I mean, is he dropping the ball? Is he learning how to read the goalie? How's his legs position? Is he spider legging? Is he egg beatering? I mean, is the ball too far behind? How is the passer? Is the passer anticipating? Are they timing the pass? Is the pass too long? Uh, do I put a defense right in front of it so they have to throw over the defense? Do I put the defense on the other side where he has to get away from the defense? So you take one drill, one, 26 right here, number 26. Take one drill, and I can make it an amazing three weeks of workout with that one drill. But I tell you that, I believe, you know, Going through high schools, I mean, I remember when people say, oh, he graduated Cochran, and then comes Adam, and then comes Tony, and then comes Hale, and then comes – because it doesn't matter. As long as you are teaching, the new players will come. I mean, the bottom line is that I am teaching them how to drive. So I'm going to make sure that you are the best four. You're going to be the best two driver out there. So I'm going to teach you everything there is to drive. Once I get that one down, I'm going to go to the wet one. Okay? And then I'm going to go to a fake and move. Right. So, again, if we're looking at these things, if we're looking at every shooting drill and how we're building our team, it, it's really not as hard as you think. But we just have to stick with it. OK. And the technique is there. And I mean, when we talk about spending a lot of time on it, I like I said, I remember when I wrote the workouts. I mean, I just basically believe in you don't need to do 30 minutes of the same thing. Our mind don't get it. Sorry, it won't. If you ask me to do 30 minutes to the same thing, I'm going to tell you to go, you know, someplace. I want to do three or four minutes of intense work because that's something else we do. We do a lot of this kind of hay in the barn. You know. But, no, I want you to be exhausted when you're finishing a three-minute drill. Three-minute drill. I want you exhausted. Four minute drill, five minute drill, at the most, maybe a six. And then move, change. So you can choose, you know, 
40 minutes of drills on a specific work that you're doing. So if you're working on driving, you probably are working on deep on offense, right? If you're working on you know, soft defense, you're probably working on tactics. You know, so if you're working on hard defense, you're probably working on individual team training. Because if I want, you know, I don't know if you guys like football, but if they get football, a lot of times they have that drill where they go offensive lineman and defensive lineman, right? And I remember watching that, and sometimes they go all out. But there are some times where they say defense go soft, offense go hard. Sometimes they go the other way around. To see the moves, to see if they are doing the right technique, right? I mean, they even have one technique that they call for us, you know, that swimming move on the lineman, right? The swimming move is the one they get under the lineman, you know, to try to get them to hold, right? So those are the things that we want to do. So then when we go back here, let's go share again. When we go back here to get over here, is that this one? Nope. Uh, no, 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 no. So when we go back in here and we're doing our training and we're writing everything down, when we go this part over here, because that's what we are right now, you know, I haven't even got to the team technique yet. You know, we are right here. So as you could, as you can see, you know, altogether, the most I'm ever going to spend is 42 minutes. There's 9, 12, 15, 18, 21 minutes, but I got 42 minutes. But if I do 42 minutes times six times, that gives me a lot of hours of training a specific skill. So if I do this with this week here, we're going to work on that drive from two and four. We're going to work on maybe the center post stop. Uh, we're going to do, uh, you know, uh, let's say on the, mo the moving horizontal, maybe a little bit of driving from the wings, you know, and maybe at the end here, we're going to do when we can get the drive going, maybe we can get a six meter shot. You know, so I can do that in all these situations and then change according to what I have down here that when I'm game plan, I'm going to be working against someone. If I'm concentrating on defense, defense is going to be hard, offense is soft. When I concentrate on counterattack, less drills on the perimeter, more drills of movement. If I go in offense the other way around, defense is going to go soft. And of course, when you're starting to tactics here is that who are we going to play and what is our greatest strength? Because that is something that we also don't do sometimes. And uh, that, you know, it can be, okay, I think it's right here. I want to take a look at this one right here. So, so when we look at that and we have the 12 week, there's the 12 weeks we talked about it. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, there's a 12 weeks. You know, you can keep this in your, in your, in your computer, you can print it, you, you can have a file of each athlete, you can have your little team manager do it uh, because it's no problem because they can just have a clipboard and you can tell them what you feel. But when we are programming our workout, when we are developing this program, you know, we're developing this whole training protocol that we gotta do, we have to evaluate. So at the end of the first week, you know, each athlete, you know, uh, and you're going through it, and it, it seems like a time-consuming, but it is not, because a lot of times you make that decision in your head. You know, so swimming ability, does it counter well? Does it counter the defense well? Because remember, I don't care if he goes a 200 IM and he's a great flip turner. That's not what I care about. I care, is, does he know how to use his speed on the counter, right? Is he quick on the drives? When he is driving, right, I mean, does he get himself open? And then I can check also the swimming training. Then I go to leg conditioning, right? I mean, he's really good at jumping. Man, coach, he has great legs. He goes jump way high. What about stealing the ball when he's moving forward? Can he push an opponent? Can he hold a position, right? Swivel legs. I mean, is he spider legged? That I means he can feel very comfortable going anyway. I'm not going to read each one of them. You guys already received this one. If you have not, just put a note in there and I'll send it to you. But you go passing and catching. All of the all the things you're doing, passing and catching. Shooting and blocking. All the, the outside shooting, inside shooting, six meter shooting, shooting off the drive, penalty shooting, six meter blocking, center position blocking, blocking on the outside. Then you go to a tennis. You gotta know that. You know, we gotta know that. You gotta know that uh you know, you got to know that, that, you know, the guy gets sick a lot. He's always hurt, but he doesn't come. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't take care of himself. 
I understand injury. I don't understand sickness. If you take care of yourself, you won't be sick. If you eat well and, you know, and so I used to always tell the players, and because I do this, I used to just go back, you know, 30 years ago, I was saying that very rarely I had guys miss practice because if they miss practice, that means that they would have to do an extra day or they would have to do an extra practice himself. I would not let him make up the practice during the time he was with everybody else. Okay. He needs to do it on his own. All right. So very few people did that. Uh, you got counter attack, of course, front court office, four court defense, six on five, weights and dry land, and game performance. Then you have an overall rating. So it seems like a lot. It is not. It is not. I mean, honestly, I did it. I did it in Brazil with a junior team and the youth team and the senior team. I did it in China. I did it with my guys in Italy. And a lot of times it wouldn't take me more than about a half an hour because all I'm doing is sitting over there. And if I'm watching, again, remember, I'm teaching. Remember, I'm not coaching. I'm teaching. And if I just sit over there and go like, he does that, I just put a check mark, check mark, plus, minus. Each one of you, come up with your own system, right? You can go double pluses, double minuses, plus minuses, slash. You don't have to write anything. And then once you do that, you start to see a little bit of a map of what you have. What, what do your athletes have? You also see by going from week to week if there's any development on that part of the athlete. Because, again, we are programming, right? So let's just say I decided to go in three cycles of four months or 12 weeks. Have the players graduated to the next cycle? You know, something, a couple of you guys from outside might not have that, but in California, we had something that we used to call Hell Week, okay? And yeah, I think everybody has a different name for it. You know, after war, they said we couldn't say Hell, you know? So we had to have, you know, uh, Challenging Week, you know, so whatever. But, you know, there's this week, and a lot of people would use that before training, before school started, because during this Hell Week, you could train as much as you wanted, right? Once you got the school started, you only allowed four hours or three hours or whatever it is. But during the hell week, you could train eight hours a day. If you wanted to, you could train seven days a week. People took trips. They went to Hawaii. They went to Europe. You know, they had all kinds of stuff. Okay. All right. And hell week was somewhere between two to three weeks, depending on what league you happened to be in or which uh, CIF or state where you went. A lot of my colleagues use Hell Week to swim them real hard, to like do a lot of physical training during that Hell Week, that two months, that two weeks, three weeks. Well, I, I didn't because I had the kids for six hours a day. So all I did was technique and tactics. All I did is techniques and tactics. I can get them in shape by other ways. I can get them in shape in the first couple of weeks of the season. Seriously? But wait a minute. So I have a chance to doing hell week, spend six hours on six on five. Guys, all of you guys out there, colleagues, when during a season do you have six hours to spend on six on five? You do not. You got to be worried. You got to be preparing for the game. You got a tournament Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or you got a game away on Tuesday and Wednesday. Or, you know, finals is this week, and the kids have to, cannot, you can't keep them in a pool more than two hours, right? Uh, if you have an outdoor pool, it's cold, whatever. There's always a reason why you can't do something. But during that two weeks or three weeks, my goodness. So what I used to do, okay, what I used to do, uh, I remember, you know, a great coach from the past named Don Stoll, a lot of respect for him. And he used to say, if you're going to beat Rico's team, you've got to do it early in the season, you know? Because I came in, I would have to say, I did not start the season in great shape. I didn't. But I tell you what, I had my offense down, my counter down, my defense down, my six on five down, my five man defense down, my special play down. I had all that down. I mean, they were perfect on that. And then two, three weeks down the line, they would be in great shape. So you have an option. You do the same thing. You have to. Be, you have your cycle. Anybody does their own cycle. It's up to you. How you do it, it's your problem. Okay. So if you don't have that, if if you don't, if you want to have your cycle of four months, where your first three week cycle 
concentrates more on technique because you know that maybe you're not going to really hit the tough teams until a little bit further down the line. Example, you're going to the Olympic Games, all right? I got a Serbia on this side, and I got New Zealand on this side, okay? Serbia, tremendous experience. All the players are coming out of professional leagues. They're really set, and they are actually going to play for the medal. New Zealand, very good upcoming team, great young players. The coach is doing a good job trying to bring them along. But their big games are probably going to be early. They have to try to win to try to get out of their bracket. The Serbia has to worry about that. Now, they, they pretty much know that in a bracket of four, usually they're going to beat two teams pretty fairly easy or fairly probability, right? So that means on their preparation, they are not preparing because if you think about an Olympic Games, we're talking about 14 days. Hey, 14 days from first game to last game. World Championships sometimes even longer. So some countries are going to have to prepare for the first four or five days because they're trying to get out of the bracket. But if you're one of the teams that are more favorite, are you preparing for those four or five days? No, you're not. You haven't even tapered yet. You will play through those four or five days. And then you won't even start to rest a little bit until you get maybe to the seventh or eighth day. So if, if this happened, even in Olympic Games, why wouldn't you do that with your season? You know, so this is what I'm saying about understanding how to develop the training program. We have to understand how we design our training program and make sure we give our athletes a chance to succeed. Okay? So I will... Send you, like I said, as soon as I figure this out here, hopefully they're out there and I'm figuring this, this, this computer thing out. Uh, Mark, I will make sure you send you uh, the evaluation and William and Bill, I'll send the same thing to you too. Um, those, those ones that you haven't got it, you know, anybody haven't got it. So Bill, I got you. Um, I got that. And then uh, let's see, Bath, you didn't get that one either. So Bath, I'll send that one to you also. Okay. Um, and let's, let's, if you have any questions right now, let's, you know, you, you, I know you didn't get it, but it will receive your shooting. It will receive your center drills. And when you do that, if it's something quick, you know, I can answer. If not, you know, try to set up something to talk with me about it. Then we can talk with just you and I in a different time. All right. So, Claudio, you too. Okay. Jimmy, you didn't get that. Well, okay. All right. Good. Good. All right. Uh, if you have any questions, now is the time. Unmute yourself. Like I said, I don't, I don't mind. If you want to ask, um, understand, really try to understand a lot about what we talked about, the soft versus the hard. Make sure you always have an emphasis on your training. You know, be smart. The, if, if the athletes respect the coach because he's, the coach has knowledge and competence, you're going to get more out of your team. You know, don't just say, do it because I told you so, okay? That, that is not a good way to approach an athlete. You know, it's best way to put an athlete is you do it and you say, hey, you know, the last couple of games you notice that the percentage of us shooting in this position is not very good. You keep dropping, you know, the ball a little bit. You know, be knowledgeable about how you talk to that athlete. That also creates a mutual respect. I also, I always believe in respect, you know, so I don't need to yell and scream and foul language. I just don't believe in that, you know, but I can pretty much destroy a player just by giving him facts, okay? But he leaves there going, coach is right. But Sorry, Rico? What you want to do. Yeah. So this question, you talk about doing your drill for three or four minutes. Um, do you then, if the kids don't get it, do you break and change to a short drill and then come back to the same for three or four minutes in order to keep their focus up? And how many times would you repeat that three or four minute session? Um, that's actually a great question because that's, that's something that happens a lot. And so usually what I do when I introduce, I usually try to introduce the drill before training. So they know already what we're going to do. And then once we are doing the training, usually about a minute to a minute and a half afterwards, I will usually make a comment if he needs it or not. Because the reason I find is that I need to back the, go back to concentration and execution. So let's just say we're doing an accordion drill where they're basically, you know, Yugoslavian square, where they're moving forward and back, constantly using donkey kick and forward step, you know. 
So let's say, even though they're doing it right, I might say, no, 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 stay posture. Don't forget, get it out, get the ball up, keep your elbows high. Constantly talk to keep their focus on it. If I see that they're not getting it, if it's one person, it's different. If it's one person, I would usually say, not negatively, because I don't believe in that. The person that's doing wrong, I'm going to say, no, take a look at Jimmy. Look how he's doing it. And that usually brings the concentration to the athlete, and you eliminate that problem. Okay? So you, you bring it in. If I see that they're really not doing something like that, I might go ahead and go, okay, guys, let's go this way. Let's break it down from the Yugoslavian square into just two-man drills and go in and out, in and out faster. So I might modify the drill within the same philosophy, but I modify it for three minutes and then move on to something else, and then sometimes that fakes itself. You know, if yeah. it really is not working, I might abandon that drill a little bit, go to something else, and then revisit it maybe the next day with a further explanation. Yep. Does that have to right. ask you a question? Yep. All right. Thanks. Somebody else? Yes. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear you. Okay. Um, would you rather develop, uh, uh, or, or rather, in another way, would you rather focus your training cycle on one game phase or do you like to practice uh, multiple things on 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 every on every cycle that's that's actually a, a great question that a lot of times paul uh, paulo depends on the level that we're coaching right so if i'm coaching on a real high level let's say a professional league in europe or let's just say a, a high collegiate team with very good expectations I might be able to do more things because we were kind of polishing where they're going to be. But I would still, in the early cycles, it's still fairly break it down by, mini, by you know, micro cycles, okay, within the three weeks, within the 18 days. But if I have more of a high school team or more of an age group team, then no, I have to spend more time. I might even break the 18 cycles in cycles of three six small cycles of three and try to, I do a lot of that when I'm with beginners. I do six little mini, mini, mini cycles of three when I work on just like passing to the right or passing to the left or, you know, how to drive. So you can break it in different ways. But I find that when you polish more, it's actually at the higher level in the international level or something like that. I think where we're talking about, I would have to say that try to keep within Choose three, four skills at a time. Uh, choose one tactic. That one, I believe, and that's the one I actually do in the pros. Anybody has, you know, that have, knows about the coaching level at, uh, you know, at the Division I professional leagues, we do work on one day. Monday is training day and game plan. Tuesdays is offense. Wednesday is counter. Thursday is defense. It's Friday is special situations. Pay the game on Saturday. That is how everybody does it. It might switch offense and defense or counter or whatever, but that's how you do it. And that's how you do it in the NBA, the NFL, whatever. You concentrate each day a little bit more on that. So you can do that within your workout. But I find because of water polo, a lot of times, particularly at the high school collegiate level, we might play two, three times a week. You know, you might have to do your cycles a little bit more of a skip. So we say, Monday, I'm going to work eight minutes on this or 10 minutes on that. And then the next day, 12, the next day, 16, or maybe I'll do it every Monday. We're going to work on the center position center for me. For example, I work on my centers on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, regardless. I find 30 minutes for them, regardless to do center drills, because you know what? You don't have a center. Your life's going to be very long. And, but I will, by the time we're finished with this, guys, I promise I've never had a team that didn't have a good center. Centers can be made, okay? You don't have to have gigantic guys either, right? I mean, hey, Spain got a gold medal with a center that was five foot ten. <laughs> Jordy Sons. Seriously? And you know what? Nobody could get him out of position. <laughs> so trust me, we're going to get there. We have time for one more question. Anybody? Water polo rules. It's always oh, good. I have a question. Go, actually. Ahead. go, 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 go. Akai. Sorry. Um, my question is, um, would it be possible for us to talk about ways to um, modify drills so that they can do it 
on land during the social distancing time when pools are open? Oh, absolutely. Most of the drills that we are putting together that I had it there, we mm -hmm. do have a modified drill to it. Okay. Oh, okay. You know, we do have a modified drill to it. So if you guys want, because, you know, we're still having a lot of this stuff, but actually it's good no matter what. Um, mm -hmm. If you want me to, we can go next week, uh, next uh, Thursday. Um, I, I can add maybe a, a 15 minute segment on just modifying these drills and how to do that and do it at land, in, on land with bands and trash cans and stools. <laughs> it's really, it's actually, there's a lot of things you can use and it works really well. I actually just did one of them yesterday with my granddaughter just to see if it works and she kicked my butt. So <laughs> she's three years old, but man, she tires me out. So I will do that, Akari, no problem. I'll make sure. I'll do that. Thank I'll you put so it much. on the next Thursday. Thank you. All right. Love you guys. Water polo rules. And I'll, don't worry about it. We'll be coming. <laughs> Thanks, Rico. Right. Thanks, Rico. All right, man. See ya.